So I can... okay, that's good news. I am <laughs> so I need to find the so Zoom is playing with me today a bit because I don't have my my tools, and that's what I usually use to share on the chat. So. Mm -mm. Continue to this. Hmm. Where are you? Okay, I I give up. I don't know where I have my mm, my tools and the chat and all of that. There may be something that I need to do. Anyway, you hopefully by now you are all. Um, familiar with that um, forum where we have and where you can find the cases. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and then we get, let me see by sharing this. Oh, I found it here. Good. So um, chat, uh, it showed up here. So then I'll bring the forum here so you can all see how it looks. So that's the forum, these are the topics. So then you get all the topics and uh, we are putting all the um, recordings next to the images and the links. So it's actually becoming kind of a, a really cool like resource because you have the images there so you can download, take a look at them and then go through the video. And so it's kind of very cool. So if we go by topics, let's go to the today's case, which should be, 78, if you click there, you get your images with a viewer, so you don't need any special software. And there, you, that's the link. Now you can copy, or I suppose just click on that and then you should open the uh, internet browser. Okay, that's all good. And now we start with the cases, with the case. Um, and let me bring back that forum because there we have a signalment um, and the clinical signs. Hopefully I put something there. Yes, it's a young animal. Oh, I don't, I don't put any breed. Well, I may try to be able to find it because this is a real case, but um, for some reason I forgot to put the breed, but it's a young animal with chronic regurgitation and that improves when fed in a pride position. So, it's a very, let's say, telling history and signament. These are the images. Let's remove all the information and then there we go. Okay, excellent. So my suggestion now is, well, as usual, we go through the images and we identify findings, everything that comes to mind, even if we are unsure if that means something or is a real radiographic feature or anything. And then, then we decide which one we want to keep, which of the, the things that we describe we want to throw away. And then we, we try to give an explanation and probably a next step, you know, if, if you have a question mark that is still there, you know, what to do next. Okay, so take a look. I got my paper and pen to take note of your findings. And at this point in time is, I probably, even though I've given you the history and I'm sure you are used to getting the history first, I suggest you try to ignore that for a minute and then go with the images and try to explain whatever is happening with the images as far as you can. And then we come back to that history and say, you know, whatever we find in the images, does it fit, does it not fit? Which expectations do we have based on the signal and history? Do we, you know, can we explain that? Okay. Um, on the DV or VD, um, there's a well 
demarcated soft tissue opacity sort of cranial and to the right of the heart in the sort of mediastinal region. Okay. I like that you are using, it's, it's kind of a very boring thing, but this is what we do in imaging. We go by this feature, which is size, shape, opacity, margination, location, number. And uh, he's on one side of the coin is kind of a boring thing. And on the other side of the coin is a very organizing thing. And then you use many of the features that we want to know. So you said that is soft tissue. We will see if everyone agrees, but at least you, 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 you define that in those terms. So it's a soft tissue, is well-defined. That's very important. Um, because that, then, then that is already saying there are a number of diseases that are unlikely. There are a number of diseases that probably are not soft tissue, a number of diseases are probably not, are not well defined. So by, by forcing yourself to describe something in those terms, then it's gonna be easier to go forward. So it's, you, you said that it's soft tissue is well defined and you even went further and said, it looks like, well, what is clearly, and there's no question is that it's in contact with the heart. There we can even use the word silhouetting or body placement of the cranial contour of the cardiac silhouette at least in one projection, which is the DV. And then you said that it seems, for you, it seems to be in the middle standard. So that's perfect. And now we keep going with people agreeing, disagreeing, willing to add more information on this. Or things will move. Okay, so soft tissue, mass, one imaginative. Middle standard. Okay, well, I'll speak, I'll say the elephant in the room. The trachea is narrowed as it gets towards the base of the heart and it's right. displaced ventrally. Um, well, so um, on both the laterals, you can see it quite clearly. And I, I can't see the trachea clearly in the VD. Okay. But it's, but it's, I don't know how straight that VD is, it's a bit, the legs are a bit awkward in the, yeah, the whole of the chest isn't perfectly straight, but I can't, I can't make it out at the moment. So one way to check how, how straight is the, is the projection, like in the lateral projection, sometimes it's not that obvious that the projection is not perfect. It, it kind of is, um, it kind of doesn't bother our, our brain that much when it's a bit oblique or it's harder to identify. It usually has very important implications, but it's, for some reason, you know, we don't pay that much attention. One thing that I suggest using is the ribs. And then if you have, you don't, you, you, you don't even aim and it's impossible to have them superimposed, let's say the right with the left and so on like here. But what do you, that would be impossible, but what, the, your aim is to have these costochondral junctions here at the same level. So if you rotate, then one is gonna go up, then one is gonna go down, or one dorsal and one ventral. So that is telling you that deg the degree of obliquity. And things don't change dramatically when the laterals are oblique, but they do change. And so it's, and sometimes they're quite oblique. And then you may start thinking, seeing things that you are unexpected and so, but it's harder to, to figure that out. So I would suggest using that in this particular case, the regas are perfect in terms of, I, I suppose everything in terms of exposure, positioning, they, they are not rotated. Probably the only question we think is they could have extended the four limb, the, the thoracic limbs a bit more cranial. So there may be some degree of superimposition of the triceps over the cranial aspect of the thorax, but that's a detail. And then in the DV, how to assess if it's rotated? Probably one way is to identify. So if you can identify this, which is the sternum, and then this, that is the spine, as separate things, that is telling you that, that that's much, that's, that's the, the amount of rotation if you want. So you want them to be superimposed. So almost not being, being able to identify that, 
that is the spine plus sternum rather than having them separated. And then another thing is that in a very straight, so here it tends to be more straight in the abdomen. This is how you want the um, uh, spinal, um, uh, what's the name of those? Processes, <laughs> okay. dorsal spinal yeah. processes. Yeah, but what's the name? Um, well, those processes looking like this. So it's just, if, if it's like if you have a pen and you're perfectly aligned, so then it's gonna look like small and just like, like around the thing. The minute the, you have it oblique, then it gets longer. So this is exactly what is happening here. Those spinal processes, uh, then they are getting a bit longer and to one side. So the, the combination of those two things is telling you um, that there is a, a degree of rotation. So I agree with you. It's not severely rotated, but there is some degree of rotation. But I, you know, coming back to your point, the trachea is narrowed and ventrally deviated, which is very good. I think the trachea um, has an interesting um, root on the laterals. It tends to go up like this and um, I think it probably narrows down the list of differentials that could be occurring there. Um, I'm not sure if the trachea is all the way over here on the DV either. Um, it may well be displaced to the left or I'm not sure if that's artifact. Okay. So at least you are suggesting that you are not 100% sure, but it may be displaced to the left. Okay, good. And then, yeah, I like how you describe that deviation of the trachea. It seems to be the, the opposite of what we had last week. Do you remember last week was, there was something in the heart base that last week was the heart base tumor. So there was something in the heart base. And we said that there was kind of that unique thing about that angulation of the trachea. So it wasn't that the thoracic trachea was elevated overall. It was that, that, it was that precise kind of angulation as it got closer to the bifurcation. This seems to be a similar feature, closer heart base, but the opposite. The other one was dorsally. The, the trachea immediately cranial to the bifurcation was dorsally displaced. The bifurcation seemed to be kind of ventral displaced, was kind of doing like that. Now is the opposite. Is the, um, the trachea immediately cranial to the bifurcation is ventrally displaced. So opposite, that's the reason why I bought this case because we, we were playing with with the, with the trachea and, and you know what are the different considerations and how we use the, um, uh, the precise deviation of the trachea. Uh, so yeah, but I agree with you. Good, so I took note. Um, I guess with any animal with a history of regurgitation, I'm looking for aspiration pneumonia and I'm not seeing strong evidence of it in this dog. I agree. And let's go. We are, um, I agree with you. Um, I said, very, thinking very good. Um, do you want to go a bit deeper in, in justifying or, yeah, very justifying why this is not pneumonia? Um, generally, you're looking at uh, interstitial or alveolar pattern um, with a labor sign, um, often ventrally. Um, most commonly right middle lung wave, because that's most dependent, but potentially can be left-sided as well or in, everywhere. Um, I'm not really seeing an obvious low bar sign um, anywhere. Okay. Yeah. On the DV, it looks pretty clear. There's like a, maybe a tiny bit of interstitial by the heart, like caudal to the heart, but not convincing. Really. Mm, okay, good. So like in, 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 when you describe like this abnormality being like a soft tissue well-defined. For me, that it was already telling me that it was pneumonia because 
that's not how pneumonia looks like. So pneumonia, if we get a sharp border, that's gonna be the lower sign. That's gonna be the anatomical separation between one lobe and the other. But usually the disease pneumonia, kind of the, the alveolar pattern is by definition something that is ill-defined. Makes sense because there is never a very well-defined border in between, between an affected lung, an affected portion of one lobe, and then an unaffected or less affected portion of that same lobe. So if we are talking within the lobe, then pneumonia is not well-defined by definition. Comparing that to a, some of the lung masses or comparing to this, makes sense. So then there is a well-defined border which again, it could be, the only exception is that in pneumonia, there could be the lower sign. But again, it, the, the other argument that you have is the other picture, the other um, uh, clear finding that we expect in cases of pneumonia is that alveolar, meaning that we can see the airway extending through the lung, the airway staying air gas field and then contrasting with the white lung. We don't see any of that in here. So the only thing that they share probably is a eventual distribution. So then that's that's a bit confusing. And then probably the other thing that I would add is that you've been described, unless there are two things, there were some comments about what we call mass effect. Makes sense that the deviation of the trachea is, is, is a mass effect. Or, and then we don't expect that in pneumonia. Makes sense, pneumonia usually it may make the, the lung lobe, the affected lung lobe a bit larger, but it's, it's gonna retain the normal shape and it's not gonna, may have a little bit of enlargement, but not that much mass effect, not in the trachea. So I'm trying to think aloud about how, if I have the question, the question is, questions are always good. So you can always say, you know, why is this not the case? I thought about pneumonia, let's play the game that is, it, it is or not. And then this is the thinking process to say, well, yes, no, these are my arguments. So good point. I, I kind of try to make that thinking very visible. Okay. Anything else? I have one thing at least, one more thing. The heart, the heart shape is, it looks unusually bulged there, but mm. it's not confirmed there. So I suspect this is probably due to the heart being rotated a bit. Um, okay. The other Good. thing I notice is the, um, is the uh, post caver just to me looks to be a little bit distended. Um, the liver possibly, um, uh, the liver is possibly enlarged. Yeah, the, the caudal border of the liver is hard to define, mm. um, but uh, I suspect it is pushed beyond the rib cage a bit there, though the stomach's sitting in a fairly normal position and angle. So, um, and then also in the, um, in the carina, uh, there's there's a degree of tissue thick like bronchial th tissue thickening. Mm. Yeah, see what I mean. Yeah. So I like your exercise um, about going to the to the abdomen. You seem to do that. You remind me of during my residency there was like a person that was visiting once in a while, and then. You know, when you're on the spot and, you know, being a resident you're on the spot and that's the whole game, like on a daily basis. Um, and that either it kills you <laughs> or makes you very strong. And, and, and then you, you start developing that, you know, confidence or knowing where, in which, at which level you should stop your confidence and say, no, now I don't know. And then I shouldn't go because then, then my, my, my evidence is very weak. I remember one guy that would show up and I, I, again, being a resident, I was always trying, for me, the most important thing was trying to solve the, I mean, we had what we call like hot chairs and hot chair means you sit in front of an image or a case, everyone is listening to you. They are trying 
they are trying to train you for the exam, which is exactly like that. And then, so you're, I remember my first thing was, it was like a, like an instinct was, even though they were telling me, you know, don't be systematic, whatever, you, your first attempt is to solve the problem. And it was, this guy was always, I don't know if he trained himself to do that. Probably I can do that now. I probably do it another time. He was the opposite. He would go all around, all the non-interesting, all the periphery. And he would always find something. And I would always miss that because I was I was trapped by the more significant change. So it's a very good idea. I what I do now is, and that's a very personal system, and it may not be the best. I'm just sharing what I do. Is I, I let the let the animal go and I let the, that anxiety go and try to solve the, the case. But I never let a case go before taking a distance. So then even if I'm happy with what I'm seeing, I make them I make it smaller in the in the monitor. And then I go through the whole periphery and everything, trying to see if I can see something else. Sometimes you see something small, and that may be the key of the whole case. So it's an it's a ex excellent exercise. So good, I, I agree with you. My, you, you kind of explain that, or, or, or even though you said, well, the control of the liver is not well seen, you also offer an explanation, um, or I think that you did. Which is, I think, it's a thin dog and a young dog. So, and the, the overall volume, even though we don't see the whole abdomen, the overall volume of that abdomen doesn't seem to be increased. So there is reduced detail, but we have two reasons for why: young and thin, and the volume is not increased, so it's unlikely to be fluid. That that would be the thinking aloud and the visual thinking. In terms of the corvina cava, I will be careful jumping on that unless. It's a very distended one. Um, and I have, now I forgot the rule. There is a rule, there is a, I think it has to be that, hmm, to start considering it abnormal, I think it has to be more than 1.5 times the diameter of the aorta at the same level. But I'm, I'm not sure I have that rule right. We can then look at it. So if you compare the Corvina Kiva here with the aorta there, it has to be at least one point five times that. Don't, don't quote me on that rule, I need to check it. But it, in my eyes, it doesn't look that distended. I really like your comment about the heart. I think you are right, it looks displaced. And I like your explanation. I think it seems reasonable to think that the displacement of the heart is secondary to whatever is happening in the cranial thorax. In the same way that there is border effacement, I think there is a mass effect, a bit of displacement. Okay, anything else? I think the tracheal luminal diameter is consistently um, at the same location narrow on both laterals. And um, you can see an area of altered, like it, both increase in, well, a variation in opacity, which um, might give you a clue as to what uh, may well be inside the mass. You've got some calcified or increased opacity um, uh, in that area in both of the laterals. Excellent. So that's why when we started by saying, well, it finds soft tissue, I said, well, I'm not sure I agree 100% because there were those small mineralizations. Um, yeah, and I agree with you. And I agree with you that they may, be, may give you a hint about what is going on. Um, so yeah, perfectly fine, I agree. And I agree with your comments about the trachea. Yeah. So the trachea is not only displaced, but it's narrow. So yeah, good, so mineralization. Do you mind pointing out the mineralizations? I can't see them on my screen. Well, the mineralization? Yeah. Like here. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Anything else? Or we try to explain and hypothesize about what is going on?
So it seems that we are done describing what, what, how can we put, and I can make a summary. Today, we don't have a lot of controversial findings. So it seems that we are all in agreement with what is going on. Not what, what is going on, but with the, with the abnormalities, with the abnormal findings. So we have a soft tissue mass, I would add now that is, it's a, it's a mass, it's a well-defined mass with a mixed opacity. Makes sense, it's soft tissue, um, mineral, and I wonder if there is some degree of gas as well, hard to tell. Um, then there was this idea that that mass is in the mediastinum, probably, probably that's the topic that we need to discuss. We discuss a little bit that mass being in the mediastinum against that mass, that increased opacity being in the lung, and at least at that level, we decided that it's not in the lung. Uh, I wonder if there's any other, if there's room to argue about the location of that mass. We said that the trachea, or, or let's say like this, if there's any argument to, to have it in an, another place, or what are the arguments to be certain that that is in the mediastinum? We need to decide that. We, we describe that the trachea is abnormal, is displaced, for sure, ventrally, likely to the left, and it's also narrow. Um, yeah, and that's it. So now we need to try to figure what is the disease process that could explain all of these findings. Another way before going there would be what is that that soft tissue that that well defined mass with mixed opacity. Where where is it or what it could be? I suspect that it's a massively dilated esophagus. Um, okay. And because it stops so abruptly, I'd be suspecting PRAA. Okay. PRAA. Um, yeah. It's a persistent right aortic arch. Yeah. I was trying to remember whether it was PRAA or PRAA. <laughs> PRAA. Um, and that would be consistent with the regurgitation and pushing the trachea down. Um, I don't have an answer for why the trachea is narrowed, because it should okay. compress the trachea, but maybe I'm missing something. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going for. Okay, so the argument for being the esophagus, I think, is the opacity, the location, the, the, the well defined, because there is still a wall. The opacity, which is mixed, mineralized, and fluid, and you are adding an extra point, which is, in your eyes, the ventral displacement of the trachea perfectly fits with an esophageal disease, with which I completely agree. And this is the whole point of this case: is you know we are trying to play with the um, displacement of the trachea, and at uh, the trachea as a as basically our most important tool to identify things in the mediastinum and to get information about the mediastinum. So I agree with that, all of, all of those comments, including the one that you're saying, I don't see that, it, this seems to be limited to the cranial part of the thoracic esophagus, and therefore I expect this disease process going on. It's not a generalized dilation of the esophagus. So I basically agree with everything. It's a good, good idea, do, then the, there's the, if, so we shouldn't stop here, that, that's, a, that's a very, well defended uh, position. The question is, can, should we think about something else? And then the question is, you are still a bit concerned or you can explain why there is narrowing, narrowing of the trachea. So maybe someone can explain that or bring a hypothesis. Or if there is any differential, or mm. well, the differential might be. And I, I think probably I'm sorry I didn't see who who said the persistent right aortic arch, but I think that's probably closer to the point. But you could think of a thymoma because it's a young animal, but I'm not sure a thymoma would displace the trachea ventrally. Um, and the only other thing I can think of as with regards to the trachea being narrow is that maybe this is a, a dog that has 
uh, tracheal disease anyway, and any kind of pressure in that area, increased pressure in that area is just causing, so maybe it's dog with dynamic airway disease. That was just a thought. Okay, I, I, will, I will sign your first comment. Um, and this is the whole point of this series of cases, about how, learning how, how to read the trachea. And I would be very, very, I would hold that idea very strongly. So I think your, the hypothesis of this being a thymoma or a mediastinal cyst, no, there's a young animal, so it could be a, a congenital large cyst, probably more common in cats, but it, this could be the case. Then I would really, really grab that information about the trachea and the, the expectation is very strong for the trachea not to be displaced ventrally. If there is something in the cranial ventral mediastinum, the trachea has to be displaced dorsally. And that is, is that simple, but that's strong. <laughs> so I would probably not consider that based on that picture. This is, this is how strong we use the trachea to decide what is going on. So a good idea, and then also good consideration about the unexpected thing. Um, and then, then I would add that that for me is very strong. So I would, I would, that's not an expectation like a mes ventral, uh, mass in the cranial ventral mediastinum should not displace the trachea ventrally. So then I would not consider that. I, I would favor the esophageal disease, which it has, clear expectation to result in ventral displacement of the trachea. So good, good, good thinking. With this, I'm not saying that we should not, considering that was wrong, actually the opposite, considering that is an excellent exercise. And then we, as usual, we explore the idea. We say, well, and then until we find something that said, well, it doesn't fit, we don't expect that. So therefore we, we, we don't use it. But the whole exercise is, is the way to do it. Anything else? I have one, actually the whole point, there are two points in this case. Ah, I'll give you my opinion about what is happening in the trachea. I think the minute that, and we, we explored this idea a little bit in another case. I remember we, had, we got a case with pleural effusion and I said, well, be aware, we, be a bit, you know, pleural effusion, we accept pleural effusion resulting in dorsal displacement of the trachea. We don't accept, and then therefore, we cannot, when there is blurred effusion, we cannot use that feature as the presence of a mass, as secondary to a mass. There may be a mass in the mediastinum, but we cannot be conclusive because just a fluid can result in dorsal displacement. Where I'm going. The next statement that I made, I remember that day was, that is all true, but what is not expected in a case of only blurred effusion is narrowing of the trachea. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, if there is fluid, fluid cannot act like a mass. If there is a mass, then it can act like a mass, not only displacing things, but compressing things. It all depends on how strong you push. So I think this is a mass that is heavy enough to, you know, to go against the trachea. The trachea very likely there is going against the cranial vena cava, and then there's enough force to, to result in a compression. Pro then the possibility of having an additional um, Malaysia or a weak, in, weak cartilage in the trachea is, is an option. It's a young animal, so probably I wouldn't be that hard on that. I think it's, this is it just in the same way that the trachea is being displaced, it's also being compressed. It's an external force. Um, and the minute that you have a mass rather than fluid, then I think you can explain displacements, but also compressions. So that, that would be my take on that. In, in this case, the most important is the direction of the displacement of the trachea. Anything else? Imaging people love this case because, you know, I always insist that we can get, usually we get closer to an answer. We are able to remove some differentials, but almost never we are able to say, this is it we always end up with a, a list of possibilities. This disease has a characteristic feature that allows us to put a stamp and know what it is. And I'll tell you what it is. It's the only situation uh, or only, I think it's the only one, unless you have a huge mass, 
the only situation in this case where this dilation of the cranial uh, thoracic esophagus where the trachea is displaced to the left. The reason why the trachea never goes to the left is because it's, it's, it's a trap or, or it's not allowed to move to the left because of the aorta. Makes sense? Do you remember the clock face analogy that we had? We, the, we never mentioned the trachea, but we mentioned the aorta as being the one that sits here, then the pulmonary outflow trap, and then the left auricle. So then the, the position of the, of the aorta there is to the left of the trachea. And then, so the trachea, it never, it never really goes to the left, never except in a persistent right aortic arch. Now the aorta is on the other side and it moves to the left. So this is almost like you could have this on a, on a board case and the expectation for someone doing imaging would be to go as far as saying that the top differential should be a right, a persistent right aortic arch because of the left displacement of the trachea. That's, that's, a, that's a characteristic feature. In this scenario where there is dilation of the cranial esophagus, ventral displacement of the trachea, that particular feature is, is a telltale. It's a very, very, very strong feature. And it's, I just wanted to show you the exception to the rule. Makes sense. Last time we talked about dorsal deviation of the trachea. Now we're talking about ventral deviation of the trachea in the lateral projection. And I also wanted to show you the only exception to the rule, the only situation where the trachea goes to the left. It usually doesn't go to the left because the aorta is there. Okay. So this is kind of, in this context, this is exception to the rule. Now, if there is a huge mass in the right cranial lung lobe, well, is the trachea going to be displaced? Yes, it's going to be displaced to the right. Um, but you will still be able to see the aorta and then the, 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 the trachea going like displacing to the left, more cranial to the aorta. Here, you don't see the aorta. So that, that the, these two combinations are, are, are characteristic features of this disease process. Um, and then I just wanted to show you because I got the CT. So I haven't touched that, but what is next? Usually if you have a case like this, the surgeons really want to know more in detail, what is the abnormality? Because that I think dictates how they're gonna approach this. So the diagnosis you kind of make with the radiographs, but then usually my experience is if you have CT available, you want to run a CT to, to give the surgeons a better idea about exactly you know, how to approach this. Um, so that's why we run the CT and then, okay, so here is where we are getting to the interesting part. So that's, um, so left, right, Here, the aorta is going to go to the right here of the trachea. That should not be like that. The aorta should be left to the trachea. So that's why this trachea is, is being displaced to the left. Then this is the dilation of the esophagus with the mineralizations. And then the, this is the characteristic thing. This is, this is just this, this is a persistent right aortic arch. Otherwise, the aorta should come to the other side. So again, this is breaking a little bit the rule about, you know, we always try to be open and we try to say, well, there are many options. We are never really, we jump on one particular disease process. This is kind of a little bit of an exception to a rule just because of that particular feature that the, the displacement of the trachea to the left. Last time we had the displacement of the trachea to the right. Do you remember with the heart base mass? Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought, well, maybe maybe I show them the, the exception to a rule. Mm -hmm. And you can show up a bit, show off a bit if you have a radiograph like this and you see, then next time you can say, well, I'm sure these are uh, persistent right aortic arch, which is this. This is all about that, you know, so. Okay, any questions?
you are quiet today. I don't know if it's um, early morning, it's the winter season. Um... I think that was just a very, very hard case, but very, very interesting. So <laughs> I was a bit stumped. Really? Hard, hard, okay. Hmm. Wait, but you got all the findings. Uh, then the, the, the extra point, the extra thing, I think, yes, it is. But yeah, then I took over and I, I kind of share that. And then and then these are the things that you're going to remember. Once someone tells you about this, then you're going to always remember. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think all the experience vets here were all over it. Um, I was just saying. I was just saying to Josh with the tits. My brain is like esophageal till proved otherwise all the time. <laughs> esophageal and aspiration pneumonia. That's what I look for first. So it's just my experience. Well, that's a that's an extremely useful um, reflex, um, and something that you should look at. You know, the the other point. I don't know if it was clear enough, but. And I think it's a very important one the, um, that is telling you that where is the lesion localization is that the cranial es esophagus, the cranial thoracic esophagus is severely distended, like massively distended. It goes to the ventral thorax. And then there is the caudal aspect of the esophagus is not even visible. So it's very likely that is normal. So the, the that that contrasts a lot with a generalized megasophagus. Makes sense. So, where, where you would see the distension of the caudal esophagus as well. Um, probably that that is worth uh, stressing. But the ones I've seen with like more generalized megasophagus have generally had more gas in them. Like it's just like a big like gas filled area. Like it was this one's more liquid in it. I don't know if that's just because of the. The blockage with the PRA or what? If you if you come here and now be aware that this dog is laying, remember that this dog is on the side. So if there's any gas, it's gonna sit on top. And this dog is on the sterile recumbency, so the gas was on top. So if you have taken a horizontal beam in this case, probably you would have seen this gas. So there is some degree of gas. And I think the, the gas is sitting here. Harder to see and hard, harder, very hard to be certain about it. Uh, but I agree with you that it's mostly fluid field, but there is some degree of gas. I suppose if you have that question and you don't have CT, if, if, and if you are very creative, uh, another way to assess this mass and the, the opacity of the mass or what it is, it would perfectly be to take the dog, position the dog on sternal recumbency and go horizontal beam. And then you will see this level line. So that's already telling you, like if you are lost and if you want to it, just bring more evidence to your hypothesis, then you could do that. And then you will see a level line, which is extremely telling. Makes sense because that rules out like a solid mass, rules out many other things. And now you are dealing with a, a cavity, a structure that is filled with mineral, fluid, and gas, and then the differentials come down a lot. Make sense? So you could do that. Um, there is some gas. I hopefully you understood my explanation of why it looks different in the CT compared to the ray graph. It's just about how the dog is positioned. Mariano, I missed the dog's breed at the beginning. Yeah, me too. Uh, I just realized that. Let me see if I can find. Um... I have a, a very large database of cases. So, hmm, how can I find? Let me see. Okay, so we can go here in the box. And then, so sometimes we, sometimes I, I, can, I come across cases and then in the clinic, and then we go by them. But in this case, okay, okay, this is the case. 
Let me, I can find that for you. It's a Chihuahua cross. No, no, no. Let's see, okay. Let's go to find the one. Okay, okay, here we go. This is it. Okay. What's growing anomaly? Kelpie cross, six months old. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, what I was saying is um, sometimes interesting cases come in the clinic and then we just go that way. And sometimes I, I kind of hold to a topic. Uh, so I think lately we've seen, let me bring back this. I need to go by topics. I think we've got two or three cases that they were related about. Like, uh, we got this case, you remember the pulmonary hypertension? And then we were talking about the enlargement of the pulmonary arteries. And then based on that, I thought, well, um, and there were many considerations in that case about are those leaf nodes, is this a mass? And then based on that, I thought, well, then we can just explore that. And that is probably not an easy area, all the mediastinum, because things are not well defined, because there's no air contrast in them. But then the, the for me, the the way I would, I, I think about it, but I also, if I need to explain it, I would use it is, it's all about the contrast. So things in the lung, they're surrounded by air, easy to see. Things in the mediastinum are not surrounded by air, very hard to see. But we have a gas field structure, which is the trachea. So that is what we grab. That's exactly what we go with. So we look for increased opacities, whatever, and then basically we closely read the trachea and the bifurcation and all of that. We really use that because it's easy to identify and it's usually effective. So then based on that idea, so well, maybe we, we explore different things and probably last time we talked about the heart base and I suggested that you go back to the case where there is tracheobronchial lymphadenopathy, which is exactly the other case where I would, if you want to explore the, the mediastinum, and the tracheobronchial region. That's the other case that I would review and go in detail. I don't remember which one was the number. Seven. Ooh, which one was it? That, this one is the case 30. And then there is again, increased opacity in the tracheobronchial region, abnormal trachea, displacement of the trachea, but this is another example, which is large leaf nodes. And then I say, well, the, the other thing that we need to explore is things happening dorsally to the trachea, and not only dorsally, but displacing the trachea to the left, which I mean, there are not too many examples. Um, yeah, another thing that you probably need to consider, not that common, in, and you would not be present in a young dog that today's case, but uh, mass coming from the craniodorsal uh, thorax could be a nerve shift tumor in an older dog that grows into the, into the thorax or a rib mass, you know, coming from the wall and then resulting in that displacement of trachea. Those will be the things that I will be thinking about. Um, so that's the explanation about the case. Yes, unusual, um, but for an imaging person, for someone that likes imaging, it's a beautiful case because of that characteristic finding that once you know it, then you can show off of it. And then, Next week is gonna be one from the clinic. It's gonna be one just a, a super interesting case. Um, yeah, you, you will enjoy it as well, but this more down to earth, it's just a vomiting day. Mario, if we want to send x-rays to you, can we send them as JPEGs or do you need them as, as DICOMs? Well, I highly recommend the diagrams, but I'm also can offer my help to, so we have a system, we can set up a system. It usually um, it, it's a bit of a work in the beginning, but once you set up your system so we can share the images, then life becomes a lot nicer because um, for some reason, well, the whole reason of having JPEGs is to, 
reduce the you know how heavy the images are and there is a price to pay for that yeah, and then detail. yeah so we don't, we don't want to pay that price so then you 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 know send them i take a look and then i'm offering my help to help you set up a way that you can without taking half a day <laughs> send an icon usually the, the setting the system up is what it may take a little time, but once you have it set up, then usually sending DICOMs is a lot easier uh, than sending JPEGs yeah. because once you have the system, it's just letting the system know, please share this with this person or send this to this server, and then it works very easy. Uh, but in the beginning, it takes a bit of time to set it up. But I, I, I insist that this, this we run with these two, two ideas. One is when we don't have uh, interesting cases from the clinic, I usually kind of go by a topic, makes sense? So now we have one that is coming from the clinic for next week, but otherwise, like in this case, things that I mentioned today, I probably be looking, we, the other topic, we've been going around tracheobronchial or hyla region, masses, lymph nodes, heart based mass, now it's of a GL, and the division of the trachea, probably what we need to explore is something more in the craniovental mediastinum or, or unusual in craniodorsal mediastinum, kind of challenge you with, an, with a case like that. Um, or we looked a lot into lung, pleural space. We haven't, exp we haven't had many, many cases about the wall, so I will probably make sense. So I'm trying to walk you through a variety of, of diseases yeah. probably representing big groups you know big 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 things a wall mediastinum tracheobronchial like and then i think there is something to benefit if if we stay in a topic makes sense because now you can compare and contrast you can yeah if you're really willing to learn you can go back to the previous presentation and, and really look at those images and see in which way these are those are different from these images go to the lymph nodes and, and look again, maybe read a bit more. So I think there's a benefit, there's a benefit, there's a, a gain from exploring topics. Yeah. Well, look, we can send DICOMs to you. It's just, I'm not at work at the moment, so I can't do it from home. Well, yes, I can probably, but I'm not sure how. So um, I need to get someone else to do it. Cool. And then we have a week. So whenever you, um, you are aware of uh, someone that's in the DICOM, just say to me, make it clear, make, bring as much information as you have, and then I'll upload it to the forum, and then we can just use it. I really enjoy the case, but I enjoy both. The cases, the selected cases, because they know there is an aim and there is a message, like in this case, but also the ones from the clinic, and that sometimes is not about that message, it's about what you see. Is sharing your experience. It's sharing. I was confused about this. There was this line there. I didn't know what to do with that. And then sharing that with others, then it's almost always the case that other people had the same issues. So then discussing about that issue, it kind of moves you one step forward for the next case. So I, I enjoy both ways. Interestingly, some of the radiologists I've worked with in the past wouldn't give a final reading on a JPEG, they'd only do so on a DICOM. Well, yeah, it's, it's a good idea. Sometimes JPEGs are, are very, very low resolution. And then the, the problem is that, I mean, it's something that you can solve and that's the annoying thing. So if you have, so if you acquire the image wrong, Makes sense. You you even they pay a JPEG or DICOM is the same thing. It just there is an error in the acquisition that you cannot fix. But the annoying thing is that you may have an excellent radiographic study. So the 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 positioning was perfect, the exposure was perfect, everything perfect. But now because they wanted to save in internet traffic, <laughs> then because that's the only problem. Now we have something that is is not good. And that is annoying because it's like, you are so close to having it ideal, um, why not? And I could see that 10 years ago, but now instead of taking 
two seconds in, in, in uploading the uh, or down, uploading or downloading is going to take 30 seconds. Well, who really cares about that? As long as you can set the, the process, it's usually not a big deal. And actually, our ability uh, to see small things, which sometimes are very important, it kind of increases a lot. So yeah, so I'm not I'm not I'm not a DICOM Nazi, but almost. Fair enough. Hmm. Okay, done for today. Thank you, Mariana. Okay. Thanks, so thanks Mariana. Thanks, Mariana. Thank you. I do my best to have it.